In 47 years in evangelical Christianity, I never heard one positive word spoken about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I heard them slandered and participated in slanderous, dismissive discussions about Mormons. Somebody like Greg Madsen and, and Pastor Jeff, they can build a bridge between evangelical Christianity and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and that's great. Basically, she says, you all are just way off, and you know, really all you need to do is accept Christ into your heart, and then everything's just wonderful. This whole trying to get people to ask Jesus into their heart to be their personal Lord and Savior, I mean, it's like the cheapest of cheap grace. All right. Hello, everybody, to our first Cougar Chronicle interview. And, and this is a very special one. But since you'll most likely be seeing this on his channel, I should introduce myself first. My name is Luke Hansen. I um, go to BYU, and I am one of the people that started an organization called the Cougar Chronicle. And we are a conservative um, news source at BYU. However, this is not a political interview going on right now. This is a interview with a very special recent convert to the church, David Alexander, who was a evangelical Christian basically for 47 years from the age of 21 all the way up until 68 now, if I'm getting that correct. And he even right. spent some time well, as even I spent some time as a pastor nine weeks ago baptized nine weeks ago and started investigating officially on Christmas Eve, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I, I uh, called mm -hmm. the, the missionaries at the DAPTO ward on December 23rd, and they met with me on December 24th. Yeah, that's right. Which I believe is actually Joseph Smith's birthday is December 23rd. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I've, had, I've had probably about two or three hundred people inform me of that. <laughs> Mentioned that. Nice, nice. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the significance of it is. You know what the odds are against that? Hmm. One in three hundred sixty-five. Yeah, one I one mean, in three hundred sixty-five and one quarter. Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. The odds <laughs> that that would happen are one in three hundred sixty-five. So, anyway, there you go. Yeah, and uh, David, you have an amazing story, which you have told multiple times, and I'm thinking just for this interview, because you've already shared that so many other places, that I'll leave it to people to go and look at that if they so desire. Your YouTube channel is just called David Alexander, and people can find it by searching David Alexander LDS on YouTube. Should be guaranteed to be the first one to pop up if you do that. Uh, his most watched video on there is about, I think it's like a 25 minute testimony of your story. And right. then we've also got Quick Media and True Millennial. Those YouTube channels also include interviews that David shares this amazing story of him coming into the church. That's so right. please go if, look if at if that. If search for my channel, what'll come up is a whole, I've probably put up 70 videos so far. Mm hmm. You know, I basically yeah, try to. You're do cranking one them day. out. Yeah, I'm cranking them out. I'm cranking them out. <laughs> but also, pe people that have testimonies that are on the channel, I, I I share my testimony and what's in my heart, and people respond, and it's obvious that they have a testimony. I say, please record it, send it to me, and I put that up. So there's also a lot of uh, testimonies of of other people, of other members who have been. Um, stirred to put their testimony on video because uh i was kind of a bit of a catalyst for that so nice yeah if you just if you sort your videos the the highest watched one would be right. your personal testimony that's exactly or at right. least one yeah. of them that you've shared yeah you share and the, your ones, story. the ones that are me have me on there and the ones that are the uh you know on the the thumbnail there's a picture of me and on the ones that are testimonies of others, there's a, a photo of them. So it's pretty mm -hmm. easy to distinguish. So, yeah, um, hearing your story, I've been curious about a, a certain thing because I recently, especially like in the past six months, have kind of spent time in more of that evangelical space. Uh, Pastor mm -hmm. Jeff is one of those people who mm -hmm. um, kind of piqued that interest just to learn because I think you have to understand where somebody else is coming from before. Sure you can speak to them. So for example, right. I, I wasn't even aware like what Sola Scriptura even was. And now right. I realize when I'm talking to evangelicals, 
Um, I need to probably first explain why there might be something besides the Bible to go to, because I'm going to be trying to tell them, oh, this is why the Book of Mormon true. This is why we have prophets and apostles. And they're like, wait, why? What? What book is that of the Bible? Like they don't even have a concept of there being stuff outside of it. Actually, so, can I respond yeah. to that? Mm -hmm. Actually, most evangelicals, at least my experience, which, as I've said, is 47 years long. Uh, the vast majority of evangelicals, you don't need to tell them about the Book of Mormon. They know about the Book of Mormon. Mm -hmm. they've, been, mm -hmm. they've been hearing the Book of Mormon slandered as, you know, they've got their own Bible. They've got, you know, this, you know, demonic additional scripture. Uh, they already generally, and I'm not saying this is true of all of them. But the va a lot of them already, um, you try and tell them about the Book of Mormon, and uh, you're not going to get anywhere. I mean, people, I, I can't tell you, uh, numerous times in conversations with Latter-day Saints, and of course, I never called them Latter-day Saints. They were always the Mormons. But mm -hmm. uh, they would say, look, why don't you just read the Book of Mormon and pray about it? And my response, just get out of here with your, you know evil additional scripture because it's it's a big thing in evangelical christianity it, you know they basically made an idol out of those 66 books of the existing bible uh and uh so even the concept that you could add something to that is, is disqualifying so it, i just say that to say generally when you if you try to talk to evangelical christians about Latter-day Saints faith and practice, you're better off. This is my own opinion. I'm, I'm not saying, you know, I'm like some great authority on this, but in my opinion, like if you're going to talk to a foreigner and you really want to win their respect and communicate with them in a way that's easy for them to understand, what do you have to do? Learn their language. There you go. Mm. Good on you. <laughs> you have to speak their language like like uh when i was living in northern maine at one point i would go up to quebec city which is just an amazing so it's like you know still got the original like defensive walls that were built like in the early 1600s and and the, the french people up there are very defensive about their language and well they should mm -hmm. be but if you go there and you even try to speak french <clears throat> they treat you with great respect because you're respecting them Mm -hmm. And if you don't try to speak French and you just expect them to speak English, they're ins they're really insulted by that. So it's just it's just wisdom as much as you can. Just because as soon as you start talking to an evangelical Christian, in order to effectively engage with them, the the boundaries of the debate or uh, debating isn't really a good idea. But the boundaries, like if you want to present, if you want to present scriptural uh support for latter-day saint faith and practice you have to present it in the language of the bible because the language of evangelical christianity begins and ends with the bible says mm -hmm. you know you, you try and introduce something outside and it, it, that's that's how the debate that's how the discussion is framed because that's the only language they accept as valid that, that's like foundational and so it's really important this is this is one thing that's problematic is that uh, i had no idea that this was true i knew latter-day saints did accept the bible as scripture but i had no idea a lot of latter-day saints are not super well versed in the bible and do not mm -hmm. have know how to uh there's a verse in um the epistle of Jude, uh, verse three, there's only one chapter in Jude. So there, it's not mm -hmm. a chapter, it's just verse three, where it says, it, Jude commands us to earnestly contend. Now that's not a, like a argumentative, argumentative contention, but to earnestly, you know, gently and sincerely contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. But mm -hmm. to an evangelical Christian, you have to be able to do that from the 66 books of what they regard as scripture, or you're not speaking their language. So, yeah, a, a, a point that to me at least seems like the point you have to start at is instead of being on the defensive, 
you have yeah. to very politely, of course, and with interest, ask them, okay, if solar scriptura means in part, you can only get your doctrine from the Bible, doesn't that mean that sola scriptura would need to be in the Bible? And if so, could you show me where? <laughs> that's Does, that's a super good question. That's a uh -huh. super good question. Would, would and, you and, recommend that as like a starting point of conversation every single time you're speaking to an evangelical or? I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Okay. And I'll tell you why. It's a really good point. But what you'll find is the better point you make, the less communication will take place. You end up talking past one another mm -hmm. because evangelical Christians, the serious convinced ones, they believe that they believe the Bible and you don't. So you bring up a scripture that demonstrates that you believe the Bible and they don't. And they just can't deal with it. It's like it's impossible for them to hear. <laughs> Uh -huh. It's literally impossible for them to hear. So you're better off just, it, it says in the scripture, uh, I think it's in, where is it? I think it's in James, but I'm not sure. It says, let every man be quick to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man doesn't bring about the righteousness of God. So. The best thing to do if you're uh, engaging with an evangelical Christian is, first of all, say a prayer. <laughs> <laughs> say, say a prayer that somehow love, love and truth. The whole, the whole point is to bear witness <laughs> to the truth in as loving and gentle a way as possible without engaging in a debate. And so... The first thing to do is to earn the right to bear witness to the truth by being a really good listener. Mm -hmm. And so I would if I was engaging an evangelical Christian in, in conversation and our, our mutual faith came up, I just say, well, you know, please just tell me tell me what you really think. I really want to hear. And, and this and is don't actually the. This is um, the reason why I would say learn about other religions. Yeah. I know, at, and this is probably a point of disagreement actually between you and I, David, and, and maybe I'll be able to convince you slightly of sure. um, where I'm coming from here. But I know you've, um, I don't know if you've necessarily recommended, but you've said, I don't see the value of members of the church watching the Hello Saints videos from Pastor Jeff McCullough. Sure. Am I representing you there correctly? I, I think... Watching them regularly is uh, could be unhelpful because mm -hmm. he's kind you know, of if, providing if I'm arguments. Gonna, if I'm going to spend half an hour a week taking something in, and what I'm taking in is someone talking and and dropping little seeds of disbelief in in my faith and little seeds of conviction about his faith where it differs. That's that's not necessarily an edifying thing. It can be informative and it can be helpful, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. If if you really want to understand how evangelicals think, to to watch him for that purpose with a uh, like it says in Proverbs says with closest custody guard your heart because from it are the issues of life recognizing that you're listening to somebody who who honestly their their faith is very much at odds with ours their their faith and he doesn't express this because it would make what he's doing unworkable but his faith is that latter day saints do uh, have a different jesus they have a different gospel they're almost certainly not really saved and, um, you, you know, but he doesn't come out and say that like evangelicals mm -hmm. will do because that would make it impossible for him to do what he's doing. But um, I, th I think that's probably what he believes. Now, a a another example of, of a more beautiful example, I think, of uh, 
like like you can see where Pastor Jeff's at, in that he continues to call it call us Mormons. He he. Uh, well, I think he he does do Latter Day Saints a fair amount, but at the beginning, before he was meeting um, more of them, I know you mentioned Greg Matson, and I actually spent a day. Well, a day, an afternoon with him and Greg Matson at BYU. Yeah. And I think the video that he's doing about that will be coming out soon. And it, it was very interesting uh, conversation. But I, I do get what you're saying, because he's it, even my personal conversation with him. And I hope I'm not telling tales out of school. But I, one of the questions I had for him was, so what are you making of the Book of Mormon since he's reading through it? Like, right. where do you think this is coming from all that? And he said, to be honest, and I hope I don't offend you. I'm not really interested in expending effort to try to explain this book. I'm just learning about it. So I'm not right. necessarily putting in a lot of effort trying to find out if it's true or not. It's just, what does this religion believe is his approach. Yeah, However, is, I think for, for somebody, for somebody who's not, you know, born and raised such as myself and many other members in the church, I think when we're talking to our Christian brothers and sisters, um, knowing some stuff about their religion is what's going to be able to allow us to ask the questions like you were suggesting that will start a dialogue between us. Because right. if I'm an alien, you know, if I'm coming from Mars and I'm landing on Earth, I walk out the door, I say, hello, tell me about yourself. And they say, I'm an evangelical. I'm going to yeah. go, uh, okay. But if I've learned some stuff about them, if I've listened to some of their YouTube videos, if I listen to Hello Saints and they say, Oh hi, I'm I'm a Christian. I might say, oh, "Are you Catholic? Roman Catholic? Practicing non-denominational? What do you think of Calvinism?" You know, I can start going into those kind of of questions now that I have some base knowledge that you wouldn't have if you were kind of staying insulated in your own religious tradition. If that makes sense. Oh, well, it makes tremendous sense, and and I think it's fine to to watch uh, Hello Saints if a person's doing it with that in mind, basically wanting to learn the language of evangelical Christianity mm -hmm. with an end towards better communicating. The thing, the thing that kind of uh, honestly just alarmed me a bit, and maybe I'm wrong to be alarmed, but it seemed to me, you know, just coming in to the Latter-day Saints that there was, there's a growing movement towards uh, uh, Latter-day Saints providing a huge weekly audience for Pastor Jeff, even to the point where he had the nerve to like, if I'm not mistaken, to start a come follow me mm -hmm. thing, you know, do, do mm -hmm. we really want Jeff doing come follow me for Latter-day Saints? But it just essentially where it seems like this was headed is uh, so many Latter-day Saints are watching him, partly because they're curious, because this is such an interesting thing that here's an evangelical Christian that is not taking it we're not getting a two by four upside the head from him all right which is and refreshing that, yeah which is very, very refreshing and and good for good for pastor jeff to not be hitting us upside the head with a two <laughs> by four but uh, uh it it seemed like um the vast majority of people are watching him actually think they're, they're like they want can't wait till he goes to the temple and reads the book of they actually think he's he's in the maybe going to be converted and i i think that's just not who pastor jeff is i think and i he, think you're right there i think yeah, that's a correct he has analysis no interest. Yeah. he's a tourist he's a tourist an evangelical christian tourist and that's really i think what heavenly father has for him is to be a bridgehead and i said this in, in my second video about this topic uh, where I said, you know, in order to have a, you know what a bridgehead is? Are you, like on either, on either end of a bridge, they, mm -hmm. they build a bridgehead, which, you know, the concrete and reinforced concrete and pilings and everything, very strong to support each end of the bridge, especially if it's a suspension bridge. Pastor Jeff is very happy with his evangel. I was miserable in evangelical Christian. I was not happy in evangelical Christianity. And generally, wherever I ended up in evangelical Christianity before long, they weren't happy with me either. <laughs> because <laughs> I was like, where's the apostles? Where's the prophets? Where's the authority? How come there's so much confusion? You know, this this isn't this mm -hmm. we're not on a 
highway of holiness here. What's going on? They're like, can't you just relax? And I'd be like, no, you know, so I, I was, they, they should be very glad to be rid of me. Okay. But pastor Jeff is very at home. He's very satisfied with his evangelical Christianity. He's not visiting the country of Zion, uh, considering, uh, applying for permanent residency, much less becoming a citizen, man. He's a tourist. Mm -hmm. He's totally a tourist. But that qualifies. He's He has deep roots in his evangelical Christian tradition, and he likes it, which qualifies him as a bridgehead. Somebody like Greg Madsen and, and Pastor Jeff, they can build a bridge between evangelical Christianity and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and that's great. It, you and know? for those for those who might not know, you know, depending on where you're coming from, Greg Matson has a YouTube channel called Quick Media, which mm -hmm. I would say is pr easily probably the largest um, faith slash culture LDS channel that's out there. And, and I Greg, highly recommend it. And Greg's Greg a good friend. Is, Greg is amazing. Mm -hmm. He's amazing. He Greg is totally qualified to be a Latter Day Saint bridgehead, and Pastor Jeff is totally qualified to be an evangelical Christian bridge, bridgehead and they can become real friends and build a bridge. And maybe at some point, like this same thing happened between Dallas Jenkins and Daryl Eves. I don't know if mm -hmm. you know the story of that, but they are like, I, the I heard it from you. Chosen, yeah. Right. And, and if you read, if you listen to the video from a, about two, three years ago where Dallas Jenkins uh, gave his definitive statement about this. He's like, look, you can say I'm paraphrasing. I don't have his words, but essentially he said, I know I, I am not making a blanket statement about every person in the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but I know that Daryl Eves and these other Latter-day Saints that I've been working with for years, these men love the same Jesus Christ that I love. And he said, I can't say that about a whole group. I would never say that about any group because mm -hmm. in truth, there's many evangelical Christians that I don't think love the same Jesus that I love. So how could I how could I make a blank statement about the Latter-day Saints? I can't. But I know that these men that I'm working with love the same. We, we've you know, we've had we've opened our hearts. We've had deep conversations about about the Jesus that we know. I know they love the same Jesus that I love, the one that died for our sins. And I I don't know, I don't know if Pastor Jeff's at the point where he would passionately say that about any Latter-day Saint. I've never heard him say that's such actually, a... yeah, that's an interesting thing because having I, I've actually I know exactly what you're talking about with Dallas Jenkins because I actually recorded and um, it just came out a little bit ago, an episode with Midnight Mormons, where we reacted to that exact interview with Dallas Jenkins right. and another um, Calvinist by the name of Ali Beth Stuckey. He, these might have been repeated comments that he said somewhere else, but he said the exact same thing you're saying in that interview. And we reacted to it and kind of juxtaposed the, no, they're a cult, we can't talk about them in a positive way with Dallas Jenkins' approach. Yes. And, and broke it down and had some laughs. Midnight Mormons is a more uh, rowdy channel and right. something like quick media I, I would but... fit right in i can do rowdy <laughs> yeah I, I but if rowdy. anybody's interested in in hearing more about uh what you're talking about they can go over to that video i could link it here sure um yeah but but and, but see, and see that, what is, that is about it's huge that a prominent well because because you said if one person had told me and eh, maybe they're not a cult maybe they're christians in reference yeah. to the church of jesus christ you might have checked it out if so I if had you go seen, back in time, 20 if, years if ago, Hello Saints existed 10 years ago and you saw a yeah. video of his, or if Dallas yeah. Jenkins was around doing The Chosen 10 years ago, do you think you would now be approaching your decade-long anniversary in the church? It could be. And see, that's the thing. As, as I said in my interview with Greg Madsen on The Quick Show, in 47 years in evangelical Christianity, I never heard one positive word spoken about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I heard them slandered and participated in slanderous, dismissive discussions about Mormons probably several hundred times over a period of almost half a century. And I never heard one person raise a voice in defense and say, no, 
They believe in Jesus. What's our problem? They believe in the Jesus that died for our... I never heard anybody raise a voice to say anything other than they were utterly disqualified. They weren't Christians. They had a different God, a different Jesus. They did all this weird stuff. They, they did all this weird stuff in their temples. It, you know, just just slanderous. I mean, now it's obvious. It's the most... The restoration is the most beautiful thing on earth. I like... I finally found life. I actually... I actually received the Holy Ghost in my heart as a constant companion after being prayed for to receive the Holy Ghost four different times over a period of 47 years. And, of course, the Holy Ghost was with me as our Father's good spirit yeah. always is whenever any human being is of a broken and contrite spirit, our Father draws near through the Holy Spirit. But in terms of actually having the Holy Ghost come into you as your constant companion, never happened. The difference is like night and day. It's stunning. It's absolutely stunning to me, the difference. And so, I mean, th this was the sixth time I got baptized when I was baptized by Bishop Massima at the Dapto Ward, okay? I'd been baptized five previous times. I just got wet. This time, I actually, you know, I was actually baptized into the Lord Jesus Christ, became a share in his death and resurrection, was able to receive the Holy Ghost and put my feet on that narrow way that leads to life, which is the covenant path that I can walk on with my friends. So it's, I mean, that's my testimony. The, the difference is night and day, but um, that, that an event... It, if an evangelical Christian of the prominence of Dallas Jenkins had been saying what he's saying now about Latter-day Saints 20 or 30 years ago, and I heard it, I would have checked them out because I was desperately looking for restored apostolic and prophetic authority because I was convinced, really, from the beginning of my life as an evangelical Christian, if you just read the Bible, the of apostolic and prophetic authority in the church is all through the New Testament. It, it's there in Acts 15. It's there in Acts 25, 21. It's there in Ephesians 4, you know, that, that he ascended and gave gifts unto men. He gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets. It's it's all mm -hmm. over the place. Ephesians we are built 2, upon the foundation of prophets Ephesians and apostles. 2. The mm -hmm. church is built on the foundation of apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And you can see it fleshed out on the ground. It's not just a theological concept, but in Acts 15, when, when there's this controversy in Antioch about whether or not Gentile converts need to be circumcised and keep the law of Moses, everybody didn't just whip their Bibles out and, and, and uh, decide for themselves <laughs> or try to... Uh, figure it out for the, for themselves in the different churches and groups or households. No, they went back and there was an apostolic and prophetic council in Jerusalem. It was submitted to the apostles and prophets. They, they cried out, they discussed it, they got wisdom from above, and they wrote a letter. It seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us. They sorted out the question. And, and, uh, and then with Paul and Barnabas, they sent them back to let everybody know what the answer was. And they went back to Antioch with that letter. And then Paul and Barnabas in Acts 16.4, they go to every single one of the of the communities, the churches that Paul had, had started around Asia Minor. And it says in Acts 6, he delivered to them the decrees for to keep, which had been determined by the apostles in Jerusalem. And so this, this, was, this was apostolic church government as, as it was intended to be. But when mm -hmm. you you are you give yourself to faith in evangelical Christianity, and it's every man for himself. It's it's like it's all over the shop. Probably of the forty six thousand different Christian groups and denominations, you know, which was two hundred when Joseph Smith was so frustrated that he went out in the grove and cried out to God for wisdom. Now it's 46,000. Well, and the, the amazing thing that I still can't wrap my head around is none of them were named after Jesus Christ at the time of Joseph Smith. Yeah. For some reason, out of all the things you could name it, nobody had, had thought to grab that one. So no. he got the trademark on it. Yeah. 
Well, the, the closest thing to it is the evangelical group called the Churches of Christ. Mm -hmm. You know, not the Churches of Jesus Christ, but the Churches of Christ. And interestingly, uh, in evangelical Christianity, the vast majority of them sideline baptism as part of the process of Christian Christian initiation. You just have to believe in Jesus. You have to accept Christ or ask Jesus into your heart to be your personal Lord and Savior. But the Churches of Christ are different in the sense that they actually do adhere closely, more closely to the formula that uh, is the restored gospel, which is that they, they call people to repent and be baptized in, in order to become Christians. But uh, the vast majority, it, the vast majority of evangelicals, uh, baptism is something you do after you've supposedly been saved. Then, then uh -huh. if you want to follow the Lord in baptism, then you follow the Lord in baptism, but it's not seen as part of the process of becoming a Christian, which is just weird really it's it's so weird yeah i've but, had a number of of pretty yeah, in-depth um at, not as a missionary just as myself uh, conversations we have people here in provo who will stand outside of the provo temple i think they're the god loves mormons group and they have their yeah. little pamphlets and they try to talk to people as they're passing by from the bus stop and so forth and right. we, we ended up having a great conversation and one of my questions to him was well you you need to believe in christ in order to be saved. But if let's just take it as a given that Christ asked you to be baptized, how could you have a person who believes in Christ and then willingly chooses not to do what he asks? Because, you know, they're saying that, oh, you're a workspace thing. You think you have to do stuff to get to heaven. And I'm like, could you explain? I don't understand. And I still don't understand the scenario of how could you have a person who believes in Christ who then says, yeah, but I'm not going to do what he says. If you have well, the opportunity, I mean, if if yeah. there's a drought or something and you can't, if, but... you're, if you're the thief on the cross, you can't get baptized. Okay, like yeah, the thief. That's one of the favorite things they like to bring up. Well, the thief on the cross couldn't get baptized, and, and we Father don't know that he wasn't prior. No, we don't. But that. Heavenly Father doesn't judge people for not doing something they can't do. <laughs> but mm -hmm. but really, it's it's just uh, you know the reality is is that. Uh, Christ said very specifically in, in Luke, I think it is chapter 6, he says, look, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things that I say? And then he mm -hmm. said, I'll, I'll tell you what somebody's like that says Lord, Lord, and doesn't do what I say. And then he, it's, it's Luke's version of the building on the rock or building on sand. If you don't, if you say that he's your Lord and you do not keep his commandments, says in first john then you're a liar and the truth is not in you christ says you're building on sand and when when it's tested everything you think you've built will come to nothing uh, john says in john chapter 14 verse 15 and 21 essentially he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one that loves me <laughs> you know <laughs> Oh. And isn't there another spot uh, also in John where he says, if you do my will, you'll know the doctrine, whether it's of my father or well, of the devil, yeah, it, something like in, that. In John chapter 7, verse 17 and 18, he says, if someone's willing to do God's will, then he'll know the teaching, whether it's from God or whether I'm speaking from myself. He who speaks from himself seeks his own glory, but he who seeks the glory of the one that sent him is a man of truth and there's nothing false about him. So it's like, and this, this is what's interesting to me is, and I don't want to uh, character, 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 caricature rise um, evangelicals, but it seems sometimes that a couple verses from Paul kind of supersede everything else from Christ. If you try to find me a parable from Christ that involves people not having to do anything and just getting salvation for free. I don't know if you can find it. I mean, like no. you need to throw your nets in. You need to go buy the field that has a treasure in it. You need to um, double your talents while the, the master is away. You need to wear the proper clothes to the wedding feast. I mean, Christ is just saying these things, saying these things, saying these things. But then you take like three verses or so from the epistles of Paul. And somehow that seems to negate everything that Christ was trying to get across. And, oh, grace is a free gift. You just have to think something in your brain, which is not an yeah. action. It's not a work to think something in your brain. And then you're good. But then the works are supposed to follow you. And I know you've in the past explained how that was a very confusing. We're supposed to be saved, but not 
try to be saved but if you haven't been saved how are you going to get saved if you can't try and it's <laughs> yeah it's yeah. a bit of a hoot i i just i, I want to go back a little bit backtrack I, th there was a little point i wanted to make about hello saints and that's that what it seemed mm -hmm. to me is that huge numbers of people were oh pastor he's going to read the book of mormon and he's going to start crying and he's going to oh god spoke to me it's true he's not i don't think i honestly i don't want to misjudge the man but i don't think he's at all interested in hearing from the holy ghost in that way and so he won't okay but but what's happening in the what was happening in the meantime and may still happen i mean people are free to do what they want to do whether they're latter day saints or not but it it just it just almost reminds me of uh, when i was a boy back in the, the late 1950s and early 1960s, uh, we had a TV and it was a big deal. We weren't allowed to watch TV on school nights, but we watched it on Friday. We could watch it a bit on Friday and Saturday nights. And then on Sunday, we ate dinner. And as a family, we all sat down and watched Wonderful World of Disney together. And then we mm -hmm. would watch Bonanza. You know, dun da da dun da da dun da da dun da da da. My dad and would watch that. It on almost the seemed like Pastor Jeff. It's like, you know, people. He's like the Latter Day Saints Bonanza, and I was like, you know, we've got apostles and prophets to listen to for crying out loud. Why would we? <laughs> why would we devote ourselves to watching this character as wonderful, as nice of a man as he is? I mean, if I can choose, and I can choose. You, you know, every little choice matters and every moment matters. If I can choose to listen to President Nelson's Overcome the World and Find Rest for the 37th time, or I can watch a new episode of Pastor Jeff's Hello Saints, it's not even a contest, man. I'm going to listen to President Nelson's Overcome the World and Find Rest for the 37th time, or better yet, look up one of pa Re President Nelson's talks that I haven't listened to yet. It's, mm -hmm. So, you know. I, that's, well, I mean, that's, we've got Holland and Christopherson me. and Oaks gives yeah. some amazing I talks mean, as well. We have, we have, I am like, I am, Luke, I'm like a kid in a candy store. All I had, all I had for 47 years was the Bible. And now I've got apostles and prophets to listen to and to read. You know, I, I can read, what what is it? A marvelous work and a wonder. I can read, I, I mean, you wouldn't believe how many books people are sending me or trying to send me or links <laughs> uh -huh. they're sending me, you know, oh, I just, bet. You, you know, the, th the three standard works. Now I've, I've got three more standard works to read. <laughs> I mean, mm -hmm. I, I'm just like, there is, there is so much that we can feast on that is either directly or indirectly the actual words of the Lord Jesus Christ, which of course, Apostles and prophets, they speak for the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's so much that we can feast, so many ways we can feast on the words of Christ. I just think it's it's really good to guard our hearts and to devote as much of our time as possible to feasting on the words of Christ every day. And any anything to me, I'm not saying uh, listening to Hello Saints is evil or something. Uh, it's just... The greatest enemy of the of the very best is always the good. It's not. It's not like I'm gonna it, instead of listening to President Nelson, I'm not gonna like, you know, you know, do something evil. But it, yeah, it, it's easy one to of be the Ten Commandments distracted. type of things. Yeah, it's easy to be distracted yeah. from the very best by something that's. You know, it's not necessarily bad, but is it actually building my testimony and increasing my faith? Mm -hmm. So that's, yeah. that's and, and that's a great point. And that is what's so exciting to to watch you about because it vocabulary wise, you're kind of almost halfway um mainline Christian, mainstream Christian, and Latter-day Saint. Because you're you're very heavy into being able to be very conversant with the Bible, referencing it very well. Um you like to sing randomly in the middle of your discussions or, or pray. <laughs> do kind of like yeah. a randomly jump into prayer which is definitely more of um a not lds uh, right. style 
so to yeah. speak. But then at the same time, you're starting to bring in some Book of Mormon stories here and there, some Doctrine and Covenants here and there, uh, general conference right. talk. And so it's like yeah. very exciting to see that uh, yeah. cross happening between exactly. those, those two worlds in your life. Wonderful. And it's, it's exciting. It's, it's kind of like, I think for lifelong members of the church watching you is as partly kind of like having kids again. You're like, oh, I remember when <laughs> I remember when riding a bike was a really exciting thing to do. That's yeah. right. Riding a bike is yeah. awesome. I haven't thought about that in a couple of years. Or oh, I remember that learning what how to add things together is really exciting. Like just watching that happen again kind of reignites that spark inside of you for things that are completely normal for us. And that's what's awesome well, and, and why it's awesome that it's on YouTube. So anybody who yeah. wants to can go and see it. Yeah. But what were you going to say exactly. about that? Sorry. Oh, um, I forget. Sorry. <laughs> My apologies. No, no, that's um, fine. I, yeah, it's great. Continue. Um, I know we, we do want to split this into two parts. So we'll kind of cut it and um have a second part coming up here after this would you like me to ask you one more question before we go or would you like to take that now no ask me one more question by all, means. all right and then you can decide how long you want your answer to be <laughs> and then we'll take okay. a break after that <laughs> yes how long do i want my answer to be? <laughs> so we we've been discussing oh. we've been discussing uh these things that evangelicals especially have with the church that you must absolutely not even consider joining the church. Um, particularly, they've added things beyond the Bible, so sola scriptura, the the Trinity, um, a couple of other things that are their their big talking points. And from hearing your story, it kind of sounded like you got to the point after 47 years, and you mentioned this just in our conversation, your frustration with Christianity and it not lining up with the Bible by the time you reached out to the missionaries, were you basically ready or already had dismissed a lot of those doctrines that conflict between our two faith traditions? Or did you also have to work through like, ah, I know God has kind of like led me to investigate this, but I'm really having a hard time with the Trinity or I'm really having a hard time with, or was it just by the time you got to the point of investigating, you were like, yeah, sure, I'm willing to Whatever God wants to teach me, I'm willing to dismiss what I thought was hard doctrine or not. That's Does that question make sense? Yeah, oh no, it makes tremendous sense. Um, I had decided very early on in my 47 years in evangelical Christianity. Um, I mean, I loved the Bible. It was just so incredible to me to find out that there was something that was actually true that I could grab a hold of. and do my best to build my life on but it just very quickly became clear to me that uh, evangelical christianity was a confusing mess and that the reason for that was because everybody had their bible and everybody felt they had the personal authority to determine truth from their reading of the word of god and came up with Literally, of the 46,000 different Christian groups and denominations, probably 44,000 of them are evangelical or charismatic Christian groups. And, I mean, I, I literally saw, personally, uh, church split after church split. Or, you, you know, you're part of a, a big evangelical church, charismatic or non-charismatic. And, you know, the pastor of the 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 leader of the uh, the singles group wants to start his own church. So he leaves the church and takes most of the sing singles group with him and starts his own church. And, and, and basically everybody has a different take on pretty much everything. Uh, there's some things that the vast, vast majority of them have no differences on like, like the Trinity because there isn't anything to do about that. You know, it's like, you know, there's nothing you can do or not do about it. And it, it was inculcated into non-Latter-day Saint Christianity from the Council of Nicaea and by 1,450 years of torturing people to death that disagreed with it. So, you, you know, that kind of 
with regards to the Trinity, there's quite a bit of unity of faith, but regards to almost everything else, it's like herding cats. I mean, even within a particular denomination, uh, people can be literally all over the shop and a huge percentage of people are denominations of one, but just such, I, I, I just found that incredibly frustrating. So I, I decided early on that there, there, there had to be a restoration of the church that happened. Like it says in uh, Isaiah, uh, the prophecies of the restoration that in the last days, deep darkness would cover the earth. But it, when darkness comes in like a flood, that the Lord would raise up a standard in the midst of it. I knew there. it talks about in Haggai that the, that the glory of the latter temple will be greater than the former. I mean, it, it's all over the place that in the Bible that there has to be that in the last days, there's going to be a great apostasy. But there's also going to be a true church rise up. And and I was convinced that that true church has to, had to have restored apostolic and prophetic authority. And it's just wild that I would not that I could go 47 years desperately searching to find that in evangelical Christianity and never even consider the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints that proudly declares and shouts it from the housetops, we have living apostles and prophets. But they were so disqualified in my mind, heart, and soul by the accusatory fog that I was steeped in in evangelical Christianity that I could not even consider it for 47 years. It's just nuts. I'm, I'm assuming you were aware that they had prophet and apostles, or were you not even aware I, of that I did. I did, but <laughs> because it would break into the news cycle periodically when the prophet would die and they would reelect mm, a mm -hmm. new president of the quorum of 12, it would break into the news that, you know, now, you know, President Monson is, has been elected as the prophet, seer, and revelator of the quorum of 12 apostles. But they're Mormons, man. They're Mormons. <laughs> uh -huh. it, it's, it's utterly worthless. They're just a bunch of deceived fools that are headed for the lake of fire. That That's not even on my radar. This is, this is the way that evangelical Christians think and speak about the it's pathetic really it, it really is it's it's such uh it's such hubris it's it's almost beyond words and i'm not throwing stones at them because i participated in this for 47 years so anyway i'm just saying i was totally on board with apostles and prophets i just never considered that the latter-day saints could have real ones but after 47 years of waiting my way through all the evangelical Christian groups that claim to have apostles and prophets, and they're out there, heaps of them, okay? And finding out that it was smoke and mirrors and they didn't have real apostles and prophets, it's like I wore myself out trying to find real, real living apostles and prophets in evangelical Christianity and came up snake eyes, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and so... The last resort of total desperation was to consider the Latter-day Saints. <laughs> so at, so, at so that point... Prophets, but also, I got totally fed up. Like I just got a post on one of my... And I get these kind of posts, and I'm thankful. They, bless these people, man. People know, don't know... They don't know their right hand from their left. But, you know, this woman, she writes in, she says, you know... Basically, she says, you all are just way off and, you know, really all you need to do is accept Christ into your heart and then everything's just wonderful. And you haven't accepted Christ into your heart. This whole trying to get people to ask Jesus into their heart to be their personal Lord and Savior or accept Christ or go forward at a Billy Graham crusade having made a decision for Christ or any of these kinds of things that are so common. And it, it used to be back in the day. In evangelical Christianity, you had to actually at least be willing to humiliate and embarrass yourself a bit by go forward to an altar call. But of course, that's largely gone by the boards. And now it's actually like oh, you know, the, the preacher, the preacher will be, you know, Christ died for your sins. And if, if you if you believe that Jesus died for your sins and you want to be born again. Now, every head bowed, every eye closed. Now, if you believe Christ, lift up your hand and say, pray for me, pastor. and then. You lift up your hand and the pastor, 
pastor says a prayer for you and you pray along with him, but silently in your seat. So nobody can see that you've admitted that you're a sinner. And, and now you're born again and your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. And I mean, it's like the cheapest of cheap grace to, to, uh, to borrow a phrase from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who wrote The Cost of Discipleship, that Lutheran pastor who uh, was martyred by the Nazis. But it's just the cheapest of cheap grace. It's ridiculous. And, and I, I got so fed up after about, I don't know, 10, 15 years, I, I just became increasingly hard for me <clears throat> to go along with that stuff. And so, what so I you're saw, very fed up by uh, diverging doctrines. Basically, anything goes as long as you allegedly can find in the Bible. Don't have apostles lack, and prophets. You seem to have lack, a concept of apostasy being repeatedly taught in the Bible, right? Right. Had, yeah, had I, you come I, I to the conclusion like that there should be more scripture or um, the Trinity where you're like, maybe this Trinity, Trinity thing's not right? Or were you still basically secure in those no, beliefs? No, no. It, it was clear to me. It was clear to me that it, you couldn't really put any stock in Trinitarian doctrine as having any power to make any difference. It's like without apostles and prophets. And people just running around with their Bible, uh, finding their own truth in the Bible and starting their own church group or denomination. And I'm not throwing stones. I, three different times I started my own church because I, I got so sick of being kicked out of other people's churches. I thought, well, if I start my own church, I probably will last longer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> you know, but the lack of apostles and prophets leads to complete disorder and disunity and and that you know an absolute splintering it leads to the exact opposite witness of what christ died for that he declares in his intercessory prayer in john 17 that all who believe in him through the true apostolic teaching would be one just as he and the father are one that the world would believe so so that clearly indicates there has to be a practical oneness of a, a people of God that's visible to people that don't have faith. But the witness of evangelical Christianity is of division and disunity. It, it's the most disunited thing on the face of the earth. So it actually doesn't prove that the father sent the son and loves Christ as much as he loves the son. It proves the exact opposite. If that's the only witness that you're looking at. And, and this is why evangelical Christianity tends to make atheists, okay? You go on Reddit to the atheist message boards, huge percentages of those people at one point ask Jesus into their heart. That's what it does. It turns people into atheists. But I just say this to say, I, I didn't, to me, the Trinity was quite nonsensical before I taught, sat down with the Christian missionaries. I and I had come to the conclusion that the plan of salvation was what you see in Acts chapter 2. That what Jesus said in, in uh, Luke 16 is true. He says, he who believes and is baptized shall be, shall be saved. Mm -hmm. He who believes not shall be damned. And in, on the day and, of Pentecost, when, yeah. the, when the church was first birthed and human beings hadn't had a chance to explain it away or alter it, the plan of salvation was Peter proclaims Christ crucified and those who are cut to the heart, who are willing to do God's will, they cry out, what must we do brethren? And Peter's response is repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. Of course, if, if words mean anything, if language means what it says, if you're not, your sins can't be remitted unless you're baptized for the remission of your sins. And then, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then he says, for this promise is for who? What promise? The promise that if you see the glory of Christ dying for your sins and that cuts you to the heart, then you repent and are baptized for the remission of your sins. Then you, you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And this promise of that, that promise is for you. It's for your children. It's for as many as are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call, which, of course, ties it into what the Lord Jesus Christ said when he said, look, um, 
No man can come to me unless the Father draws him. So if that is the promise by which a person is to come onto the narrow path that leads to life, if that's if that's the normal the norm for Christian initiation to bring someone out of the world and onto that narrow path that leads to life, and actually it's more than that because then the very next verse it says, and that day three thousand souls were what added unto the church, added to them. Added to who? The next verse. They continued daily in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking in bread and in prayer. So they, they go through that, and then they're added to an apostolic and prophetic people. They, mm -hmm. they weren't given a book and a new belief. They weren't given a Bible and a new believer's packet, and they didn't put Jesus in their hip pocket. They weren't sent back to Cappadocia or Antioch or Tarsus or Rome to to. Find a way to serve the Lord and use the Bible as their only only rule of faith and practice. They came into an, a people that was on the foundation of apostles and prophets with Jesus mm -hmm. Christ being the chief cornerstone. And I saw and all this. Was 30, what's I mean, that? This is implying like membership records. It would appear that to get that number, you'd actually have to take the names down and have, OK, these are the members of the church. These ones are not. And have that organizational structure that existed back then. Yeah, I I don't know how organized they were. They might have been far, far yeah, more. Yeah, organized. probably not the way we are now. But <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they they wouldn't have been like we are now. But the the point is, is that this is right there at the birth of the church. And I saw this thirty years ago, and I was trying to find it in evangelical Christianity, which is basically like what is it like? It's like. Um, I don't know. It's 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 like it's like trying to pick apples off an oak tree. <laughs> you know, I spent 50, 47 years trying to find apples on it on in a forest of non fruit trees. It's like, you, you know, I was I was looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, song. You know, <laughs> I, I was looking for apostles and prophets and all true, true living apostles and prophets and unity of faith. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all a, a plan of salvation that actually conforms to the Bible. It, bottom line is evangelical Christianity drove me crazy because they really m in many ways don't believe the bible but the pretense <laughs> is that the bible's our only rule of faith and practice and what it's produced to me is an ungodly mess and a huge part of the apostasy that was prophesied would fill the earth in the last days and that i i just want to qualify that by saying there's millions hundreds of millions because there's just 600 million evangelical and charismatic christians on the earth Hundreds of millions of them are really dear, sincere people doing the best they can to serve God according to the best understanding that they have. And I know Heavenly Father honors that and appreciates that, but they, they're not they're not in the, the true restored church that actually has a covenant path that can allow them to fulfill their divine potential. And they're not on a foundation of apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, which is the only thing that can bring the power and authority for human beings to be brought together as one and fulfill their divine potential. So you, you can see from what I'm saying, it took 47 years, but by the time I sat down with those missionaries, the pump was pretty well primed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm going through in my head and it sounds like you'd already taught yourself half of lesson one, half of lesson two, uh, basically all of lesson three. And there's yeah. only five of them. So you're like halfway there already by the time you sit down with them and you I, process the, through the main things that they'll bring up as arguments against the church. The big challenge was. Can I believe in Joseph Smith? Can mm -hmm. I believe that the Book of Mormon is the word of God in the same way that the Bible is, and even better, because the Book of Mormon hasn't been messed with. And any person who is honest and has integrity and has deep experience with the word of God knows the Bible has been messed with. You know, it, it's, it is true that you can trust it to the extent 
that it's been reliably translated and transmitted. But the English, just the English version of the Bible at this point, there's, you know, there's like a hundred translations to pick from. And they don't have the whole point of the of the scripture. It was brought forth by prophets and it needs to be broken down and communicated uh, and taught under the authority of apostles and prophets. I mean, that's obvious from the Bible itself. That's not mm-hmm. an extra biblical conclusion. So anyway, yeah. They were, so I, the biggest challenge for me was actually believing that, that all that stuff with Joseph Smith actually happened and that he was called as a prophet, that the Lord Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father appeared to him at the age of 14 in that grove, called him, gave him, showed him where the golden plates were, gave him the gift and power of God to translate that, brought forth the Book of Mormon, and that that's actually like Bible. That was like a huge thing for me to overcome because the Bible was the only real thing I had to grab a hold of for my whole adult life. So that was the big challenge. The other stuff, um, well, and, and this is connected, coming to believe that Joseph Smith really was who he is, a true prophet of God called to bring about the restoration. The the whole polygamy thing almost threw me, mm-hmm. you know, but, but actually that that's a whole story in itself, but it became yeah, really I think clear you did like me. a 45 minute video on it. I did a video just yeah. on that because, uh, you know, I almost stumbled over that, but I, I, cried out to our father and he opened my eyes and showed me that that was totally from God, that that wasn't something that Joseph, and it wasn't about sex, you know, it it was, uh, there were some very good reasons why, why our heavenly father commanded Joseph Smith to bring that into the church for a time. And, uh, that the people that trusted in the prophetic anointing of Joseph Smith enough to receive that, they essentially, they were like the heart and soul and core of the church, even up until recent times. I mean, it, it because they passed a, an Abrahamic level test, you know, in order to do that. It was just uh, that that really was a glorious thing. And uh, but I almost I almost gave up on on uh, mm-hmm. Joseph Smith based based just on that. But fortunately, I was so deeply convicted in my heart that I was grieving the Holy Spirit by judging him for that, that I I had to really just get on my face and cry out to Heavenly Father to open my eyes and give me some revelation about it. And he did. He did. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's an awesome part of the story. So well, let's we uh, will, Yeah, we will. Uh, we'll take a break and we yeah. will see all the rest of you in part two. Okay.